Okunoshima Island in Hiroshima Prefecture has become very popular as a tourist destination to go and see the wild rabbits that live there. But the island has a much darker history. I had the chance to catch up with visual journalist, documentary filmmaker Fritz Schumann, who spent six years researching, recording interviews, and taking video about the Okunoshima poison gas history. Down Okunoshima. So it, it took you six years to make the film, is that right? Yes, and still continues. I still like find out something new, and uh, it's just a, such a broad topic and very complex issue. And there aren't really that many people diving into the research of Japanese poison gas, especially not foreign people, um, from various reasons. Just language barrier, obviously, is a huge, huge, huge is issue. But also the people that are involved, or like the um, historical witnesses, they get, um, they become less and less each year, and they are not like super willing to talk to everyone. So I was very fortunate through the six years of like active producing of the film, um, that I was able to find so many people and so many um, um, supporting hands in this endeavor. Um, you see in the credits page, and it's like just people and people and people. Um, I definitely couldn't have done it alone, but um, it definitely needed, like, for a story like this, it needed a push from the outside. Because um, I know friends in Japan, journalist friends, who tried to do the stories, but they couldn't um, for lack of resources and so on. But I was fortunate to um, yeah, follow through with the story for uh, around six years. And now, as you've seen, um, one result of this work is a 30-minute short documentary film that I uh, produced, shot, edited, directed, and all the things. Um, and there's also going to be a book, um, hopefully it will finish next year or two years. So uh, I'm shooting and collecting um, uh, visuals for the story and ideas for the story for six years. Um, to shortly recap, the story is about Japanese poison gas production on the island of Okunoshima. Um, Japan produced a great number of um, poison gas and chemical weapons during World War II, specifically only uh, for the use in China. Um, and they were only they were ma majorly produced in uh, Okunoshima, an island nearby Hiroshima, that is now known as the world famous Bunny Island. Because the uh, after the war they kind of said we want to give the island a new image, not the uh, poison gas factory it was once uh, it was uh, was once, but a new cute Bali island. Usually, the international traveler will only go because of the rabbits. Yes. And then there's a hotel there, but uh, the poison museum is only in Japanese. The uh, derelict buildings are interesting to look at, but I think the information is not really available to the English language or the non-Japanese visitor. So, what you've done in this film to kind of expose and make the stories very clear and accessible is a real service to the story of the history and heritage of the local people who survived that and have that dark history as part of their heritage. And I, I was really interested in the people that you uh, focused on for the 30 minute version. I know you said you did so many more interviews um, but could you talk a little bit about the people that you chose for the 30-minute version? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, the information is very sparse, like there's not much available. And I think the work that I've done is also as a thank you to, to um, the people that I interviewed that shared with me their life story. So I wanted to have a very comprehensive uh, piece of work uh, to, to appreciate what they've been doing like almost all their life. Uh, met with um, Masayuki emochi san he uh, is, used to be a teacher uh, nearby Hiroshima. He grew up around the area, around the island. And um, he was told as a young boy, as a young boy he knew poison gas was made on the island, as many local people knew poison gas was made. But he didn't know how much, and he was told 
that poison gas, Japanese made poison gas, was never used to harm anyone, to kill anyone. And he believed that. I mean, why would, you know, the grown ups lie to him as a child? And then he became a teacher himself, and that's what he told his students, his children. Um, Japanese poison gas never harmed anyone, never killed anyone. And in the late 80s, um, around the time the Showa Tenno died, um, that's when he learned the truth. Uh, not the full extent, but he was so mad and so furious. And uh, Yamachi san is a very calm and collected man. Uh, but when he gives like these tours on the island to people who want to listen, and uh, uh, when he's teaching at the museum, he erupts in just this anger and like this. You can see how much this has been boiling inside him. And uh, Yamachi san is also friends with Reiko Kada, though. Um, I didn't know that. Um, I was told that Eko Kada, she was a, a student worker. She was 14 years old when she was working in the factory. Um, she uh, later collected her memories and her drawings and like a sort of diary about that time, uh, which is very valuable information um, because no image, no photos of um, the factory in production exist, only her drawings and her memories and other memories of people who worked there. And she is one of the few people who actually is very um, outspoken and very public about it. And I found this book, this diary, and it was very so inspiring the first time I saw it. Uh, like I couldn't sleep that night because I already saw the film in my head. Like I, you know, I want to tell the story of this young girl in this poison gas factory. And I was told like um, she's dead, and, and you know, uh, she's she, you know, she was very old. She was 14 years old during the war. So she must have been very old. And I was told uh, she was dead several times, but then I actually found her. She's still living nearby the island, actually. And I interviewed her. And uh, when we first met, um, uh, and I, first, I brought her a letter saying that as a German, I'm very curious about the post-war history um, difference between Japan and Germany, because Japan was the fascist aggressor in Asia to start the war. Germany did the same in Europe. Both countries committed war crimes, but how they dealt with it is very different, especially for Japan. So I was very curious about this, and I wrote this to her in the letter, and she said she's thinking about this for a long time now as well. She wants to speak with me. So when I met her, uh, she greeted me with, you know, Fritz, uh, recently two of my friends died here, and I feel very sick, but I wanted to stay alive at least until I can tell you my story. And like just this, just this pressure on me as a young journalist to, to share her story. But I wanted to do a really good job, so I met her twice. We did two very, very long interviews for the old lady. It wasn't easy, but um, I managed to record her memory and her voice um, for this this project. Um, I also met with a um, former imperial um, soldier who used poison gas in China, something that Japan to this day denies having used poison gas in China. They admit that they brought the poison gas to China, which still is actually, and still making people sick, but they deny to this day um, that they have used it. But he, the uh, 101 years old he was, um, I met him, um, he admitted to having used poison gas for Japan in the war, um, and he shared his story with me, and this was very fascinating. I, mean, I had trouble understanding him, and I needed help with the translation for him, but he was very clear in his memory, even though he was old. But he, it, it showed me that he thought a lot about this, what he has done, and that he made his peace with it. And what he said, like the way the poison gas worked, how they used it, um, I could later confirm that with documents I found. Um, so like he didn't make it up. It was really like what he experienced. Um, I also went to China um, to meet a leading expert on Japanese poison gas in Beijing who actually learned Japanese just for this research and he was able to prove the existence of Japanese uh, poison gas bombs in an area in China where they didn't assume or they didn't say it was, but there it was. And he made the, the photos of the poison gas uh, shells in his hands. Unfortunately, one year after our interview, he passed away due to cancer. Um, and it was very unfortunate because he was very very supportive of a um, international dialogue between China, Japan, and Korea to um, make amends uh, of the post for history. He was a part of a group, was actually leading a group of um, uh, historians from all three nations to create a joint history book for students. 
Um, but when he passed away, uh, this effort kind of died down and the um, discussions kind of died down. It's very unfortunate um, that he passed away. Um, and uh, I also met the mother from Kamisu, Kamisu Ibaraki Prefecture nearby Tokyo. Because Japanese poison gas not only harm people in, J in China, but also people in Japan. Because in every single prefecture, poison gas was found um, after the war, because it was stored there, used for training or whatever. And Kamisu is actually the worst affected uh, town uh, in Japan. 282 people described to have developed neurological diseases like spasm or like migraine, something like that. Uh, not all of them were accepted by the Japanese government for aid, um, but many people described like the diseases. And I met with a mother uh, and her infant son. Uh, he was uh, three months old um, when he was exposed to polluted water, because the poison gas was polluting the groundwater in Kamiso, uh, over a large area actually. And he, uh, to this day, is uh, mentally handicapped. Um, and they think it's because of the water, because he was um, exposed at a very young age. And uh, this mother was, he, she's still blaming herself um, that she gave her infant son the water, even though she didn't know that it was, was poisoned. Um, and because Japan to this day has not, is not very open about the poison gas history, they have issues as well, like they can't claim um, like financial aid or uh, responsibility from the local government because the government by itself kind of denies any involvement in poison gas. So like the decisions made in World War II and right after to keep it secret um, still affects people to this day in Japan. So it's not just like a bygone issue, it's a very current issue that's not addressed by many people. It's That is so shocking to me. Um, but we saw kind of the same logic applied again after Fukushima. Mm. When the Fukushima radioactive waste, it was announced that the waste would be stored at every prefecture. Mm -hmm. is, is that the same logic for the poison gas? That if we move it everywhere in Japan, then everybody shares the burden? I mean, what, what is the logic? behind that? Uh, well, they moved it everywhere for several reasons. For training, for um, defense, uh, like some um, military bases that took it in for like if the um, Americans invade or something as a defense mechanism, um, claiming that the Americans would do it themselves, Americans would use poison gas. And uh, to be fair, um, like during that time, during World War II, like most major nations had poison gas stockpiled because of the Gen Geneva Convention of 1925 formally kind of forbid poison gas, but the use of poison gas, not the production. And it kind of allowed you, if you are attacked by poison gas, you are in your right to retaliate in kind. So if Nazi Germany would attack America with poison gas, which they, which they actually you know, um, thought about, um, America could retaliate in kind. And for that reason, for example, uh, the US had 20,000 tons of poison gas stockpiled. Um, they dumped it all after the war, but they had it. Japan, for example, um, Japan produced 9,000 9, tons of poison gas. So a bit less, but they, they produce it with a clear intent of using it and they have used it in China. So they, they uh, supplied all of like, um, like all of prefectures and like different bases. For various reasons, some things like went to Kure or like um, navy bases where they put it on ships and then when it was sent to China. Um, so, and some just went to military schools, like, you know, see, this is poison gas, this is how to use it, and so on. Um, I think of Fukushima, this, they, because they haven't done that yet, right? I mean, they, they wanted to have the, the nuclear sand and the reactive soil, they wanted to supply it, but like, as far as I heard, like, the prefecture said, we don't want that. So it's like very, the, the Toko area and the Fukushima area is like very left alone. And it's definitely the case um, with the people in Kamisu and other aff affected areas. Like they're all on their own. They, they can't really address the issue. And when I premiered the film uh, last year in Hiroshima, the um, International Film Festival, uh, and I finished the film just eight days prior. <laughs> so it's very really just on time for the festival. Uh, I went around and like, for example, the taxi driver, um, when he took me to a place um, and we just started talking, uh, I said, I'm, I'm with the um, 
the film festival and he asked me about my film and I said Okunoshima and he immediately said yeah the poison gas thing right so the people in Hiroshima they know the people around the island know but people in Tokyo people beyond Hiroshima they don't know and even if they do know if they even if they do care they don't know the full extent of it because it's just like so uh, difficult to get the right information and that's the thing like getting information is one thing getting the true and the right information is one other thing um, like the English website of the island uh, admits they have produced poison gas there but they say they produce six tons um, of poison gas on the island even though they produce nine thousand so it's just like a huge disparity um, so there's information uh, as you said there's the the museum but the museum is also very one-sided most of the time. It's very like, we produced this here, the workers were suffering, and um, there's only one sign that mentions uh, the victims in China of Japanese poison gas, and sometimes the sign kind of disappears or moves away. So it's always often up to Yamochi-san to like check if the sign is still there, and then if it's not there, he puts it back there so people know. And also, I don't know when you've been there last time, but they, they since, I've been there last time in 2018, and they since updated, so they get like some brochures in English and even in German, uh, but like the general gist of it. They don't mention the full extent, but I think they, they improved a bit. And I've also seen a study by the University of Hiroshima, um, about the reason for visiting, and that's true, as you said, like most foreigner, I think 97% of foreigners go to the island because of the, um, uh, the rabbits. Um, so it's, it's, it's very weird that you have this cute bunny island, but hey, yeah, don't, don't think about the poison gas and the wartime history. Um, and it's kind of like, uh, it's a metaphor for all of Japan. You know, think about the anime, the manga, the kawaii, Aesthetics. Don't think about the, you know, Nanjing. Don't think about the wartime atrocities. Um, so, in a sense, the story of Okunoshima is the story of Japan as a whole, and the story of Okunoshima is a story not really told a lot. Um, so, I'm, I'm very fortunate I was able to collect so many stories in the six years span. I still collect stuff and I still find out new materials, especially about like the German involvement for the poison gas production. It's so interesting. And I think, as we talked about before, as a German citizen who you have grown up in a country that had to own its mistakes, its past mistakes in history, and then studying what happened in Japan, what are some comparisons between how Germany uh, is transparent or I, what was there any contrast that you you found when you were well, researching? When I first came to Okunoshima, I made the comparison of like building an amusement park on Auschwitz, um, and I think it was a bad taste to think that. But I think that that kind of described my feeling. Like I couldn't understand how would you do something, particularly on that side. I mean fine, have a Bali island in the country, but does it have to be on the one island that produced 9,000 tons of poison gas? Does it have to be particularly there? I don't get it. And it's just such a like cute washing. I don't think I've seen this somewhere, but I'm, I'm coining this phrase now. It's cute washing of like the past. And uh, I was, when I first started this project, I was like, oh yeah, Germany handled the post-war history much better than Japan did. And that's how kind of like um, approached this project. I was like saying Germany did something better than Japan. But I had a very meaningful discussion with a Chinese scholar in Berlin. And he basically said like, yeah, that's a very white thing to say. Like who's to say that the German way is the right way? And Germany only changed because of huge pressure from outside forces, from Poland, from France, from Britain, to kind of fess up and own up to the war crimes. And it took up till the 60s to actually like deal with it. But we made some um, set of rules for us that, and that we still go by um, to own up, as you said, um, to these war crimes and they're still in effect. And I think that's a huge difference in Japan. Uh, I think there was pressure, at least as far as I know, from Korea and from China to actually own up to it. But it's very, very complicated, especially for Korea, for example. Japan tried to solve it on the state level. But the victims, especially of the, the comfort women issue, um, the victims don't feel um, heard enough or like apologized to enough. Um, and I think it's not for any country to decide um, if the atonement is done. 
I think it's for the victims and the victimized country to decide if the entombment is enough. Um, I'm not sure if, I think for France at least, because France is considered the closest ally to Germany. Um, I've seen a recent survey, uh, who, what kind of nations do you think is the closest ally to, or who, what kind of nation do you trust as a German? And France is like the number one. And I think this was a, well, there was a huge movement towards this. I learned French in school because of a contract made in the, I think, 70s um, that French kids should learn German and German kids should learn French just as a way to understand each other. Um, and uh, as, a, as a child, I was like so annoyed by having to learn French and like all the weird words and such. But now I really appreciate it because when I go to Paris, I can understand the people and I can understand um, France's issues. Um, and I think that's a huge step towards mutual agreement and that was clearly missing in Japan. Um, I mean, Japan, uh, for the most part, before K-pop and K-drama came along, Japanese children did not learn Korean, even though it's the closest neighbor. And like coming to Japan the first time, I couldn't understand that because we learned the language of our closest neighbor. Polish people learn German. Um, but even if you look at the British, the British don't learn foreign languages. But in Japan, I was like, okay, why do you learn English the, of like the ally that's like the farthest away from you, not Korean, not Chinese, um, even though Korean people and Chinese people learn Japanese for various reasons. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity of gaining understanding of, of, of each other. Um, but honestly, yeah, there, there were many missed opportunities like this. And now we are in 2020. The poison gas issue is like, they still deny it. Like it's 2020 and they still deny having used the poison gas. And only in the 90s, they kind of admitted to uh, the comfort women issue. It's like there's so many generations and decades of just lost conversation and lost understanding. And I think that's, that's the biggest issue. Um, like all the lost time and like the people who had a voice in the whole thing, uh, people who were victims, Many of them have passed away. The people who were perpetrators have passed away. So there's no really a chance. And now it's just like so hardened. The re relatives of comfort women, I, mean, I don't know how many comfort women are still around. I think less than 40 or 30, very few people, even though there were thousands of them. Uh, but the families of them, they must still be so hurt. And, and just like, it's not gonna get easier. Like the families can hardly, give the, uh, get the forgiveness that their ancestors deserve. And the same with the poison gas issue. And it's still creating victims to this day. Still poison gas shells explode in China and hurt people and make people sick. Because poison gas is like uranium. And again, coming back to Fukushima, um, like it stays dangerous for decades. Um, like uranium, uranium emission and radioactive substances, they are staying dangerous for decades. Um, and the problem is not solved like doing a one-time thing or looking at a one-time uh, apology. And I think that's kind of like the responsibility of Germany and that's the way I see it. Like have your responsibility lead your actions and um, continue to atone and continue to learn from the, from the history. And uh, I think I said this last time, but it's, it's worth repeating. We, in 2015, we took in about a million Syrian refugees and one reason there were several reasons, but one reason in particular that Angela Merkel also stated, like we have a responsibility as Germans from our history to take in people hurt by war. Um, so like this decision in 2015, 70 years after World War II, um, is directly related to it. So it's many decades, many generations later, but we still actively think about it. In, J in Japan, um, it's not an issue. And I also mentioned this last time, um, when I came to Japan the first time in 2009, very young, uh, very uh, uh, barely able to speak Japanese, I was surprised how little uh, people think about the war, especially in Tokyo. Because in Tokyo, nothing reminds people of the war except the bloody Yasukuni shrine. In Hiroshima, it was different. In Hiroshima, it was the first time I uh, met people who actively think about the war and have an opinion about this and also think about the perpetrating side of Japan as the aggressor. Um, because of the, one reason, because of the history and also the atomic bomb dome, you are confronted with the building, you are confronted with history every single day. Uh, so you have to form an opinion about this. I don't know anyone in Hiroshima has no relation to the atomic bomb one way or the other. Um, and that's, that's how the mind is kind of shaped by these, these historical experiences. 
And Tokyo is just like, you know, high skyscrapers and other buildings. Like nothing reminds you of Tokyo of the war. And in Berlin, uh, if I walk around like just 500 meters from my home, I see so many buildings with bullet holes from the war and we still keep them as a reminder. We don't want to like, you know, wash over it. It's like, you know, this happened. People were shot here. Um, and we have many, many monuments to the victims of World War II. And there are still many groups who think it's not enough. Um, there's uh, um, a monument for the um, Sinti and Roma who got killed, a uh, monument for homosexual people who got killed in the Holocaust. Um, so many people and so many things to remember. And, and uh, some groups of victims are saying it's not enough. So it's a constant debate we have uh, about like people saying it's not enough and people saying, um, you know, it's all right. Like, when, when do we stop? We're running out of space to build more monuments. But yeah, it's not for us to decide when, when it's enough, it's for the victims to decide. And unfortunately, with the poison gas issue, there are less and less victims of at least the war times um, each year. Well, I think in terms of long-term sustainability of Japanese society, as well as um, sustainability of culture and tourism, I think owning past mistakes like we see in Hiroshima. Um, I really like it in Hiroshima how they are very clear about what happened. They, they try in the museum to talk about um, what Japan did as an aggressor as well in the Peace Museum. I think there is a really good balance there and a lot of um, information from many sides. I think they've done really well. But in the same area, in Hiroshima, we have Okunoshima, and it's all hushed up, and nobody's talking about it. It's not in the textbooks. It's mm. not being taught to kids, honestly. Um, so until so many things about Japan's past choices in wartime or, you know, in other decisions over history, until that becomes more transparent, it's really hard for the next generation to mm. move on from that and to, to own that part of their history and develop better relationships in the future. Mm. Right? So I, I really hope that it, it becomes, thanks to your film, it becomes more of a conversation and then that also hopefully too. can develop, right? Um, uh, Bo Ping, the Chinese scholar I interviewed in China, um, he said something uh, very interesting to me. He said he makes a clear distinction on three levels um, when it comes to Japan. He hates the Japanese government, and I think we all can 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 kind of relate to that. Um, he has many Japanese friends, and he loves Japanese food. So for him, uh, there's a, there are levels of separation when it comes to Japan, and it's a, I think that's a good move because for many people in China and in Japan vice versa people in Japan think oh Chinese are just stupid and evil and whatever many people in China think the same but he was able to separate that he was able to separate the action of the government that for example um, decide what comes into the textbook to like the friendship level and um, I think maybe there's a clear distinction between like the prefecture of Hiroshima and the city of Hiroshima because when they built the museum on the island, and that was only done by activists, and also the only reason the ruins of the factory still remains because of activists, because of families um, who want to keep them. Um, they collected donations for this museum because the prefecture didn't want to build it, and they needed two million yen or something. Um, and one million came from the city of Hiroshima. They asked the city of Hiroshima for a donation, they were like, yeah, sure, let's do it. The government didn't give any money, and the rest they collected from just, you know, private citizens. Um, and yeah, there are so many activists that I met in Hiroshima city and also Hiroshima prefecture who are very supportive of the dialogue. Um, just Yamuchi san, or like even Okada san, the former student um, worker in the factory, she um, wrote a book specifically aiming to apologize to Chinese children um, who were suffering from poison gas. Um, the mother of, from Kamiso that I met, she went to China and met with victims of Japanese poison gas there. And they felt like they shared the same history. So it's very difficult. Um, it's, I think that's also why I went beyond saying like, oh, Japan did something wrong. Because um, it's very complicated on a citizen and private level. There's so many people looking for this dialogue, looking to, to apologize. But they also take on the burden that should be carried by the government. They take all this pressure 
and guilt and carry it by themselves and they all feel guilty, they all feel responsible. Yamauchi san has been to the island around a thousand times, educating so many people, thousands of people probably by now, and he still feels um, a guilty conscience of having lied to his students for so many decades. Um, and yeah, it's just so many levels of guilt and blame and and missed opportunities. And yeah, I agree with you, it's not sustainable. You can't have a sustainable relationship with China and Korea if you don't talk about water and issues. And I think that's, that's where we started. Um, I think some people in Germany feel like we are weak, always talking about our mistakes. I don't think it's weakness. I think it's, it's, it's maturity, it's being responsible. Um, and it's the only way to build a long and trusting relationship with other countries and not thinking about the short-term gain. Um, of like current political goals. Um, I hope this will change. Um, when I was a student in Hiroshima, exchange student, um, there were some Korean and Chinese students and they were specifically aiming learning Japanese. Uh, they came to Hiroshima to learn Japanese. Uh, one guy, Paku, uh, was his nickname. Uh, he went to military service as one needs to do in Korea. And his parents hate Japan, still do, because of wartime memories of the grand, um, grandparents. Um, and, but he, and he said he was brainwashed and like Japan is the enemy. But he is learning Japanese to teach Koreans Japanese to like have a bridge between two countries. So I think on a, on a small level there's something happening. And as I said, like the K-drama and the K-pop, I know there's some dialogue happening, at least in a pop culture way. So I'm, I'm a bit hopeful this will change in the future, but it will take such a long time. And um, as we see now, currently we have a comfort women issue in, in Berlin because the statue was built and Japan demanded its removal. Um, like it's still such a sore thing and so many un unresolved uh, issues to this day. Yeah. Um, well, I, I really love that about your film and how you talk about uh, people who are trying to communicate their personal experience and make positive change on a personal level with the groups that they talk to. For example, Okada-san talking about her experience in the picture book, working as a child in the gas factory, and then hoping that that can serve as a kind of apology to Chinese children. And then in the film, you also said um, the Chinese scholar's daughter, uh, I was able to empathize with her story in Japan because of that book. So yeah. you, you have shown that it is possible to reach out with an olive branch and create new communication and new dialogue about these very difficult topics. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I think it can be done. Um, it's just like, it takes even longer time, I think. Um, and as I said, like I approached the project of saying Japan did something bad um, uh, and Germany did something good and I changed it. I think like, um, uh, I, think, I think I started like Japan did something bad and you should feel bad about it. Now I did the story of like Japan did something bad and you should know it. And what you do, what kind of actions follow with the knowledge that's up to you, and how you how you address this, and how you how you incorporate this into your life and your your decision and your thoughts. That's that's I think that's how, how I want to create the film. Um, in the future, I want to uh, go to universities and have screenings. I always had one at the Hiroshima City University, um, where half the students fell asleep. <laughs> That's uh, a very uh, somewhat usual I heard of Japanese schools, but I want to do more screenings and also had some invitations in Germany to show this in universities because I want to, um, yeah, I just want to like reach out to people because I've met with Japanese scholars here in Germany and they never heard the po about the poison gas issue and the information material I collected so far is, is very interesting to them. Um, corona kind of like put a hold on that, but this is definitely something I want to continue. Um, like have screenings. And I do this not just now uh, while the film's like fresh, but do this for like years. I can imagine having like uh, more screenings in Hiroshima in the future when I'm coming back or something. The city said they're very open about it and they're very, they want to help me because it's very local history 
but also very unknown history, even, even to locals. Um, so yeah, I think the, the poison has issued not just six years, it has been with me, but it will be with me for a long, long time. Um, and hopefully inspire some action, or at least make people aware of what happened. Um, I think I'm, I'm less of an activist, I don't wanna... I'm more a journalist, for sure, like I wanna collect the information and then have people, uh, help people make their own decision, but I'm not like going to the island, holding up a sign, demonstrating. Uh, I think that's not my role and I think I'm better suited to put my energy towards collecting these stories and materials and as I said, I'm, I'm still collecting. Um, I mentioned this uh, earlier today. Um, the Germany was involved with the Japanese poison gas production, not just because we were allies, you know, Nazi Germany and Japan were allies. Uh, and, but also in the 1920s, they sent a German expert to Tokyo to develop the poison gas before it was put into production in uh, Onokoshima. And this guy was never mentioned in any books. Um, and uh, I was able to trace um, him and find like letters he wrote to people and was kind of like able to reconstruct his life. And then a couple of months later, I was able to talk to his grandson, who's still alive and living in Berlin. Um, and it's just like fascinating how deep this goes. And if you really put in the time, how much more you can find, because no one else so far uh, bothered to look up and to look into it. Um, and I mean, why would they? It's such a remote and distant topic. But for me, as German, and for me, it feels very close to Hiroshima. It is a very important topic for sure. Yeah. Well, it's. It's wonderful, and like you said, it's documenting the stories and documenting the evidence that you've collected over so long and sharing it to people who are willing to listen and then starting a dialogue. That's, that's all you can do. And mm. of course, there is role for activists, there is role for researchers, there are roles for academics, but your visual medium, what you've done with this film is also very important. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for all your... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, speaking of academics, yeah, because there there's some academic information about, available on Japanese poison gas in Japan by Japanese academics. But it's just like so hard to read and so inaccessible. And I met, I talked with two scholars and they were like, oh yeah, the information's out there, whatever. And people can just go for it. And it's like, so people won't look for it if it's not uh, like told in an appealing way. Um, so it was very important for me like to have a, not just a film with strong stories, but also strong visuals. Otherwise, people wouldn't give it the time of the day. I mean, in, film is a visual medium, so why not make it you know, beautiful? You can have it beautiful and hard-hitting and truthful at the same time. Um, and this was my aim from the start. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I, I hope we can uh, make it more accessible to the general public sometime. And uh, if you have a showing coming up anywhere in the world, let me know and I'll, I'll try to post the link below. Thank you so Thank much. You. you can find out more about Fritz Schumann on his website, photographfritz.de, or on his Vimeo channel, where he has all of his short films. <laughs>